Dr. Khan uh, comes to us from Johns Hopkins. Uh, he is a, a Californian. Uh, he grew up uh, in Los Angeles. He went to UCLA uh, and then uh, meandered across the country uh, and did his uh, PhD at uh, Georgetown University. And subsequently, Jeff uh, did his MPH at uh, Johns Hopkins. Uh, he uh, has been in a number of uh, institutions, uh, including East Carolina University and uh, Medical College of Wisconsin, and then uh, where I became friendly with Jeff at the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis. And uh, for the last approximately 10 years, uh, Jeff has been at uh, Johns Hopkins, where he recently ascended to the directorship of the Berman Institute. Jeff has had a, a, a career that really has uh, moved in uh, remarkably uh, surprising and wondrous directions. Uh, he may be the only person that I know of who uh, has been uh, in a, uh, featured in a popular uh, movie that uh, hit the big screen and also uh, has been the most profoundly thanked person that uh, Jane Goodall has uh, ever thanked relative to his contribution to the field of protecting primates, uh, owing to a study that he did with the Institute of Medicine. Uh, Jeff's influence is uh, very broad. Uh, he has uh, played a role most recently with the Institute of Medicine, in, including uh, stem cell biology and uh, really in gene editing, uh, where he uh, played a critical role in authoring uh, the statement and the policies that uh, the Institute of Medicine uh, crafted relative to uh, this very uh, difficult and thorny issue. And uh, without uh, any further introduction, I have uh, my pleasure to introduce Dr. Khan. Thank you, Jeff, for being here. Of course. Thank you for having me. So hello again. Um, as you heard from, from Dr. Cornfield, um, I'm from Southern California. I, I know from my long um, time living in California that you might hold that against me, but please don't. My, my wife actually is from San Jose and is actually visiting her parents as we speak. So. I can sort of claim both parts of the state. Um, the, the title of, of my talk, as you see, is um, Ethics and the Limits of, of Science. It could easily be flipped around and talk about science and the limits of, of ethics. Sort of um, the, the take here being science is advancing in ways that are very difficult for us to predict and, and plan for and be prepared for when it comes to ethics and policy. And, and my talk, you'll see, is really about how far that is pushing in the context of application to some areas of children's health and the ethical challenges that ensue. So that's sort of where we're going. We happen to be sitting, as I'm sure not lost on anybody, in Paul Berg Hall. This is, a, in my world, a famous paper from 1975. From this quick scan of the audience, some of you weren't born in 1975, but this is a very famous event in the oversight of science and the advancing technology related to recombinant DNA in this case, the so-called Asilomar Conference and its products, published as a lead article in Science by Paul Berg et al. You'll recognize those names. It's an important um, statement for how the scientific community in this particular area would be responsible in the carrying out and use of the science and effectively regulate itself. It's an important um, watershed moment in the way scientists thought about their own responsibilities when it came to this new technology. Um, I think didn't have quite the effect that they had hoped because government regulation quickly followed, but it was an attempt to sort of say, we will be responsible and we can sort of say that for the field because of the few people who were involved. They were in, in the United States and they were in the UK. So fast forward. 2018, science is not like that anymore. I don't have to tell anybody sitting in the room. So there's no single country that we could point to that could take leadership, or two countries, UK, US, it doesn't work that way anymore. Unlike recombinant DNA in the 1970s, CRISPR, Talens, the, the gene editing techniques that we hear about in the news, and I'm sure many of you work with in your laboratories, require much less expertise, cost much less to carry out, the tools are much more widely accessible, much more democratic environment, small d, not, not political democratic. And that's a good thing, but it makes it very, very difficult for us to think about how self-policing might work. It really can't, is, is the take home here. There aren't mechanisms for that. 
and it's much more difficult without the concentrations of expertise and therefore the leadership that would come from an example like our DNA and Paul Berg and his colleagues. So let me then launch into a couple of examples. So this is a, the news release from the uh, effort that led to the report that David mentioned that I had some involvement with. The National Academy of Sciences hosted an international summit to try to bring together relevant parts of the international community to discuss what was going on in the use of human, human gene editing. So gene editing, not plants, not microorganisms, not um, domesticated animals, but in human applications. And important here are the people who were the conveners. Right? So you see there it says US National Academy of Sciences, US National Academy of Medicine, which are actually part of the same organization. Importantly, though, you've got the Chinese Academy of Sciences and the Royal Society, that's the UK. So an attempt to bring together the discussion in an international context to discuss issues related to human application. So where, where are we? And um, some of the comments that have come out of the previous session are actually relevant here. I'm going to talk for a few minutes about so-called mitochondria replacement. So I heard one of the questions from this side of the room about um, mitochondrial DNA diseases, diseases of senescence that may be related to mitochondria. This is a story about people who know, women who know that they uh, run the risk of passing on mitochondrial DNA disease, and so they have really no option to have genetically related children who won't carry that disease or suffer from that disease, except for some very novel reproductive technologies. And that's what I'm going to talk about in a second. And the question in this context is, when is it ethically permissible, if ever, to begin the clinical trials of a technology like this? So we sometimes talk about first in human trials, the first time we've tried something in a human subject. But this is a sort of first time we've made a human this way trial which raises all sorts of really challenging contexts for the paradigm by which we have oversight policy and, and maybe in very m most importantly, informed consent. So we think about the way we answer the question about whether it's time to go first is risk-benefit, and then we ask the individual, after we've disclosed the information about risk and benefit to them, whether they're willing to participate. We can't do that in the context of a reproductive technology. So here's a cartoon, obviously, of how that technology might work very quickly. You've got a woman who knows she's at risk of passing on mitochondrial DNA disease. And to remind you of your um, basic developmental biology, mitochondria pass from mother to offspring, always. Right? We don't get any of our mitochondria from our fathers. There's a little bit of mitochondria in sperm to make the tails do what they do. But that's degraded after fertilization by enzymes that are in the egg. All right, so 100% passage of maternal mitochondria. So all the mitochondria you have, thank your mother. The, the, those women, women who know that they're at risk of passing on mitochondrial DNA disease, can't pass anything but the disease causing mitochondria. And so one thought was, let's get new mitochondria for those women. We can preserve their genetic relationship to the offspring by keeping the nucleus, right? but getting new mitochondria in the cytoplasm. And so the picture here is effectively two eggs, one donor egg, one egg of the woman who knows she's got this risk, take out the nucleus from each, take the nucleus from the woman who wants to have the child but has this mitochondrial DNA disease risk, and put it into the cytoplasm of the donor. So you're putting together two eggs, making one. Donor mitochondria, the woman who wants to get pregnant, nuclear DNA. Never been done before in humans. This can't happen in nature, right? This is not like IVF, where we help what would otherwise be happening naturally. This can't happen naturally, right? So once that's put back together, you then do ICSI, intracytoplasmic sperm injection. So you inject one sperm into that reconstituted egg, and you then implant that growing embryo into the woman's body. So it's a a very hands-on version of a reproductive technology. OK, make sense? I'm happy to explain more, but you all are following. Good. OK, so how do we think about the ethics and oversight of this? And one, is this gene editing? Right, so we're taking 
a genetic contribution, albeit a small one, from a donor and putting it together with a, where the majority of our genetic inheritance comes from, from the mother. It's not really editing, but it's certainly a kind of different combination of genetics than would otherwise be the case. So we can think about the ethics and oversight and policy related to it in ways that are informative for frank gene editing. Okay, so here really quickly, a report again, this comes from the National Academies, um, answered this question or made recommendations about what to do. I was the chair, full disclosure. The biggest question comes from this issue. So while it may not be editing, of the genome, it's this new combination in ways that create heritable genetic change. Because now you've got maternal DNA from a, a, a donor that's going to be passed on to that offspring and to that offspring's offspring if that offspring's offspring are female. Right? So you can actually stop the problem or address the problem that you may think is introduced by this related to modification of the germline so we've introduced a genetic change that can't be stopped once we've unleashed it by saying we will limit this technique to, only, to the creation only of male offspring. You must only have male children if you use this technology. Seems like a kind of odd place to end up, but, but that's one of the recommendations of this report, at least until we know more about what happens to children who are born this way if we go forward. Other aspects, as you see here, I won't talk about them all because I just don't have the time, but we can talk during the comments if you like. So this notion of human genetic modification that's heritable, as it says here, warrants significant caution. We need to think about how to do this, and the restriction on male offspring at the outset is one way to make sure we know more before we go forward. But it still seems like an important enough goal, prevent the transmission of mitochondrial DNA disease and, and help families have children that are genetically related to them. I should have said at the beginning, there are ways for women who have this risk to have children, they just aren't genetically related to them. You have donor egg, so you don't do the reconstitution part, you just get a donor egg, fertilize that with partner sperm, and have a child that way, can adopt, go childless. There are, there are options, it's just they aren't options that these families find fulfilling or satisfactory. So, I've, I've said this, the point being, limiting to male offspring breaks the heritable genetic change problem, and that's one way we might address this. I will say the UK has gone forward in this area ahead of the US, and they find this restriction unacceptable. So we've got a policy difference already, in that in the UK they're going forward uh, without limitation on gender selection for the offspring, on the ho in the hopes that they will do it in a careful, slow, one-at-a-time way and learn enough as they go not to confront a problem of this heritable genetic change in multiple generations. It, they'll know much more as they go forward such that they don't need to restrict at the outset. All right. So there are ways to address what are the ethical issues, the, the biggest of which is this problem of affecting the germline. And then the question is, how can we go forward under, under what conditions? And so this committee issued recommendations that um, were about how slow, how fast, how to share data, how to make sure that there were very carefully limited uses in the clinical trial phase, that FDA would oversee it in the way they usually do. This would be the first time, by the way, that the FDA had overseen a reproductive technology. So up till now, there had not been an IND required for reproductive technologies because the view is the FDA only oversees things that are greater than minimal manipulation of human cells. This is certainly greater than minimal manipulation. And so they asserted their oversight authority for the first time in a reproductive, in the context of a reproductive technology. It's an important kind of landmark. All right, I'm gonna jump ahead just because I'll run out of time otherwise. So some conditions as we go forward as sort of guiding principles, and this will be relevant not only for mitochondria replacement and the clinical trials of that technology, but as we move into gene editing in humans. So we need to be transparent, public about the sharing of information, 
There should be protocols deposited in places that are common. So part of the challenge here in these kinds of examples is there will be very, very few cases at any one place. And we won't be able to learn enough from the very few cases if we don't pool information from across not only institutions but, but countries. And that's an important and, and somewhat difficult thing to do at the moment. There needs to be much more public engagement around how these issues um, are viewed by the public. We don't do that very well in the United States. They do it much better in the UK, in fact. We can learn a lot from the process through which they have gone in assessing this particular example and how it ought to go forward. In fact, they had a vote in the House of, uh, in Parliament in the UK to decide whether to permit this to go forward. Um, given the way Washington is working at the moment, we wouldn't get anything through our Congress, but that may change in the future, we hope. But we don't think about that as the mechanism by which we would um, think about whether a new technology ought to go forward or not. Okay, so in December of 2015, so that's Obama, still a post-election, pre-inauguration, seems like eons ago in terms of what's happening and the speed at which things are happening, but this was not that long ago on the calendar. There was uh, information, I would say a restriction inserted into the budget bill to the FDA which said, you as the FDA may not receive a license application for an IND for any technique that either modifies a human embryo or relies on the modification of a human embryo. So MRT is actually not permitted in the US end of sentence, which puts us in a really interesting position. So UK is going forward, as I've mentioned. We not only are not, but cannot. And that applies also to gene editing of human embryos, but people aren't proposing to do that quite yet, at the clinical level, at least, in the United States. So we're, we're stopped. And unless that restriction is removed from the ongoing budget bills, that will be the reality of the United States policy. And, and we will begin to fall behind in areas like this. Which I will say, having talked to some members of Congress about this, they're, they're more concerned about that last part of what I said. We will fall behind. It's a kind of not competitive in the area of science anymore. And they're much more concerned about that than they are about the ethics of the thing that's being restricted. So at some point there will be a, a, a tip, I would predict. Okay, so we have this restriction in the US. However, people are, innovative, ingenious, and so a clinic in New York, led by a guy named John Zhang, opened a satellite of that clinic in Guadalajara, Mexico. This is not a, not a hypothetical, not a fiction. And a couple from Amman, Jordan, came to the clinic in Guadalajara and they performed, at least they reported that they have performed the technique that I showed you. So first time, never been done in the world before, no clinical trial, just as a straight on therapy for this family. And it was announced, as you see here in New Scientist, the exclusive report of the so-called first three-parent baby. So the three parents being the mom who donated the egg, the cytoplasmic donor, the mitochondrial donor, the, the mom, the, the nuclear DNA donor, those are the two mothers, as it were, in this three-parent idea, and then the father, of course, from the sperm donor. Now, I, I, I would push back on the three-parent part because the contributions are very different and have different meaning, but that's obviously headline writers at work. Okay, so absent or in spite of this public health um, service restriction on any consideration of such things, somebody figured out a way around it. Let's go to a place where there are no rules. So the problem there isn't so much bad actors, although that's part of the story, it's that prohibitions give people incentives to behave that way. So prohibitions are a really, really bad idea. Restrictions are great. Let's do this in a way that's responsible under very careful oversight, which may feel like restrictions, but at least it allows us to go forward, which is the UK model, by the way. And so banning stuff means people will go places where they can do what they want anyway. All right. Coupled with that, now we move into frank editing of human embryos. There was a report, which I'm sure you all know, uh, that Chinese scientists were 
claim they were successfully able, at least they tried and thought they got some results related to the editing out of a thalassemia gene in in vitro embryos. Not destined for reproduction, not destined for implantation, it, just in vitro, but human embryos nonetheless. That's uh, something that would not likely happen in the United States, at least not at the time this was done. This was sort of the bow shot that led the National Academy in the US, the Royal Academy in the UK, and the Chinese Academy of Sciences to say, we need an international summit. And so they're sort of taking the same thinking and taking the tools that are now more widely available and applying them in human context. This is the, just a screenshot of the report that David mentioned, it came from the, the combination of the academies that I mentioned before on what to do about human gene editing in, in uh, terms of social policy and ethical implications. All right, statement of task here is important only for that boxed thing at the bottom there, which is in addition to focusing on US policy, the, the committee which I served on was tasked with creating international guiding principles or principles that could guide international behavior. This is a real challenge. There isn't an example of that working in any other biomedical context. We don't have treaties that cross international borders about how we will and won't behave when it comes to biomedicine. And so this is sort of a tall order, at least if you think about it being anything more than kind of hortatory, you know, you shall not, or we will try not to, or we will be responsible and, and behave well. So here's what we ended up doing. Recommendations are there, look them up at your leisure. So here are the seven principles that were identified as being the ones that were relevant and that all countries that want to make policy, that's that funny shaped box there on the right, says any, any nation considering governance, so taking principles and turning them into governance is the act of policy making, can, it really should be should, incorporate these principles and the responsibilities that then flow from those principles into its regulatory structure and processes. So I could give an hour long talk about the seven principles here, I won't do that. You can see them, they're very high level. And as you start to articulate them and figure out how they apply, there'll be some very clear differences among the parts of the world in terms of their commitment to various aspects. Promoting well-being seems like an easy one. Transparency is easier in some parts of the world than in others. Do care, which means be cautious as you go forward. Being responsible in the way you handle science, that's reporting what, you, what works and what, what does not. Respect for individual persons, well that carries a lot of weight in the United States and also in the UK, not so much in China. And, and that's not to cast aspersions on, on how Chinese think about that as a, as a societal value, it's just different, right? And so there will be interesting issues as these start to get applied and policy gets made in reference to them. So this will be the sort of wrap up here and then we'll have time for some of your questions and comments. So I've already sort of signaled this. Principles like those that I've shown are not the same as governance. Far, far, far from it in fact. And as you sort of start to get into the weeds of governance you find all sorts of disagreements about even what may be the level of principles. And translating those principles into governance requires, I mean, you, you will have undoubtedly conflict among some number of the, even the seven principles when you start to, to make policy about them. And so you need to privilege some over others. Respect for persons in our context would likely trump a lot of other things. Not so in places like China. And so societal, as it says here, societal and cultural differences could lead to significant differences in governance informed by the same set of principles. And if the aim here is to try to create some kind of semi-harmonized environment by which science can go forward, that's the goal, right? Not to restrict, but to help things go forward in a responsible way that we can all benefit from. We need to really dig down here on this particular aspect. And then there'll be cultural dis differences and wi different weights accorded to things like public engagement. And the, the Chinese member of the committee on which I serve said very openly, how would we engage a public of 1.2 billion people? How do you even think about doing that, right? How do we do it with 300 million? 
let alone times four. So really big challenges if we are serious about what that means. And then people will find places to go where they can get what they seek, like the Jordanian couple going to Guadalajara. And that will create incentives for people to create opportunities for them to come, right? It's not just demand, it's supply, and those things obviously go together. And so even within this idea of, yes, let's all harmonize, there's an, an incentive, um, a motivation to maybe skirt the, the rules a little bit so that we get an advantage and people come to us rather than go to you, whatever that means. So the last thing I'm going to talk about is this notion of an emphasis on public engagement. And the human gene editing report from the academies really drills down on this at some level of detail and says what you see here, essential that transparent and inclusive public policy debates precede any consideration of whether to authorize, permit clinical trials for indications of human gene editing of embryos. And then there were some conditions that we put on when it was time to go forward which was a very, very few cases for dread disease that have no other real mechanism by which we would prevent them in the next generation. It's going to be a very small handful of examples. HD from both parents would be one example, where there's no way that those people can have an offspring that would not be affected by a really horrible genetic disease. Then we might say, go ahead, edit and at the embryo level, knowing that it would introduce a modification that would be, then be passed on by that individuals, into that individual's offsprings, offspring, and so on. Although, what's so bad about getting rid of HD from a family line, right, would be the answer. Okay, so how, how will we think about asking the public, what does it mean, do they get to vote? Do we just take their input and say, thank you very much for sharing, but we're going to do this anyway? I mean, there's all of this really challenging stuff that we need to figure out how to do to make whatever public engagement really meaningful. And as I said earlier, the UK has actually shown the way here, but at the cost of many millions of pounds in their case, um, and over a very long period of time, it took about 18 months for them to do a full engagement of the public related to mitochondria replacement, which then led to the parliamentary vote and eventual approval. It's really onerous to do and really expensive to do, but if we're serious about taking the public engagement part of this seriously, that's what we would need to do as well. So to jump a little bit forward as I finish up here, the Oregon Health Sciences Group, I'm sure you know this story, um, actually turns out to be the same group that wants to do MRT in humans in the US, Metalipov and his colleagues, have reported, although with some um, pushback from the scientific community about whether they got what they said they got, the successful modification of in vitro human embryos and removing a deleterious mutation. So now we saw the Chinese example on one end, it's sort of bookend 2014, this report in 2017. Very few years on the calendar, but lots happened in science in between. So where do we go next? And this is my last slide. The international dialogue will continue. There's supposed to be a meeting in somewhere in China, calendar 18 probably a little aggressive, maybe it will be early calendar 19, to carry on the work that was done at that first international summit in 2015 and the recommendations from the report I've mentioned, further articulating the principles that I gave you a very high level summary of, trying to get to something like international norms, so we some harmonized approach to this, and then from that will come state level, that means country, not states like California versus Maryland, country level development of policy, which would then lead to real oversight with enforcement and teeth. So lots of work to do between now and then. I guess the good news is people are working on this and taking it seriously. And so um, with that, I will stop and we'll have time for some questions and comments. Thanks. Well, Jeff, I, I guess I'll lead off and uh, I'll uh, ask uh, if you think that our country is in any way uh, ready to partake in a policy level discussion uh, that would have be so pregnant with 
ethical issues, uh, considering the, the fractiousness and the, the current environment yeah. in the U.S.? Um, no, I guess is the really short answer to that question. And so the question is, where, where does that conversation happen if it's not a sort of full, engaged public debate? Uh, and there's been a lot of criticism, and I think rightful, uh, that these decisions are made inside of closed conference rooms in Washington, D.C. Uh, by so-called experts. And so I will say I'm, I'm, I'm as guilty as, as anybody because I'm at th those tables. Um, but for the mitochondria example, we, we actually, during the course of that committee, held many uh, open public sessions and heard from um, women and families who were affected in ways that at least a slice of the public that was relevant had the, an opportunity to really inform the thinking and the process. Now that may be in a way worse, right, because you're getting a kind of biased um, delivery or, or in, injection of information about why this is important without hearing from the folks who might say, that may be important, but there are other ways for these people to have children uh, and it isn't appropriate to be mucking around with human embryos in this way. Um, obviously, by my saying that, we, we were sensitive to the other side of the argument, but you, know, you sort of have to, to give voice to the um, stakeholders that, that matter most and are willing to show up and, and talk. That, that's what we have been doing. I, I don't think that's sufficient. And so how to do that better so for instance, in the UK and across Europe, actually, they do a kind of public survey of people's attitudes towards all sorts of things that are socially um, potentially a little controversial, including science. And they, they take the temperature of the, of the population that way. Now, that's a kind of, you know, again, high level, but it's more than we do as a way of informing those conversations. So I, I don't, it's not what I do for a living, but talking to the people who do it, say we can do much, much better. It's, it's hard to get to the sort of ideal, but let's at least start. Uh, well, speaking to, do we have a question? Oh, I'm sorry. There's something on the screen. <clears throat> so we do have a question. How does nuclear DNA communicate with yeah. mitochondrial DNA? It's, it's what good. if they don't match? Great question. So I should say, say before I answer this question, because it's going to sound like I and, and pretending to be a scientist. I, I studied molecular biology in, in um, college at UCLA, although it was only called microbiology then. It was sort of early, early days of molecular. Um, and I... I 1960s. <laughs> in, the, in the 70s, but yes. <laughs> Thanks a lot. Um, and, and I, you know, remember my own developmental biology education as being kind of fuzzy on the whole notion of what mitochondria even do and how they work. And so w when this committee was formed, there were actually two mitochondrial um, scientists, one who was a mitochondrial biologist, one who was a mitochondrial geneticist. And we asked that question, and they, one, one is at Caltech and the other is at the Broad, so serious pedigrees. And, and they both said, we don't know. So if the people who do that for a living don't, don't know the answer, that sort of tells you something about the state of the understanding of mitochondrial biology. Um, now that said, there's all sorts of things we can point to that may be evidence you can decide, you know, helpful or not. So there are, are haplotypes of mitochondrial DNA, a handful, six or seven, which are um, regional in terms of the, the globe, so where your ancestry m matters. Um, and so one way to sort of blunt that concern that we have a, a, a strong mismatch between the mitochondrial DNA environment and the nuclear DNA that it was, had evolved within, we could say only do mitochondrial donation from someone with the same haplotype as the woman who's needing the, the transfer as a way of trying to keep them together. So, so one, just to say two more words about that. So, the thought is that there's been evolution over obviously long periods of time in human mitochondrial DNA populations based on where people lived and there are different demands on mitochondrial populations based on the environment in which you find yourself. So people who, live, who evolved in the Andes have different mitochondrial needs than people who evolved at, at equatorial regions. But now the world is different where those people can actually mate with each other and they do. 
and it turns out that the offspring of those people don't have any problems, right? So it, it, that seems like a kind of mismatch, right? You would be introducing, and it doesn't seem to be the case. And the only um, bench lab evidence of what happens when you get really strong and forced, forced mismatches is in Drosophila, where you can make the male offspring sterile. But that's about the only negative effect they've been able to introduce. Now, it's hard to measure you know, brain effects in Drosophila, whether you've made them less cognitively able or something, because that's one of the theories. And that's part of the challenge in this area. There isn't much science in, in uh, bigger, larger animal models. There have been a handful of primates born for, after MRT, literally a handful. And so you sort of ask, well, what's enough animal data before we go first in human? Great. I think we have a question on the left. OK. Hi there. Um, you had mentioned, um, sorry, yeah. uh, with mitochondrial replacement therapy and many other new therapies, as we create, you know, as children are, are created with these technologies and might be the first of their kind, um, you had mentioned it's important to to study them in a in a controlled way, um, and you know, looking at these individuals, they offer a lot to science and society in terms of how we understand what these new technologies are doing. But how do you balance the ethical, um, the, the rights, when you mentioned the right of persons, balance the right of the child um, as, as they grow and have more of an understanding of, of their um, right as a person, and also in the context of international norms where different countries might have different perceptions as to um, children's rights or the age of majority or the age of when um, children even need to be assented for, for research. Yeah. So that, that balance of the child's right versus their parents and societies. Yeah, great, really great questions. Let me try to answer that two, two ways. So one, one of the recommendations in our report, and I'm, I'll point you to that, you know, have a look, is that there be a, a commitment on the part of the parents to long-term follow-up of their, ch their children, their child, which you know, parents have that um, ability when their ch children are not yet of age of assent and certainly of age of consent. So what happens after the age of consent? You can't force somebody prior to their existence to, to be a long-term research subject. Right, and so you know, with full understanding of that, there needs to be some way to collect data. And and the, one of the problematic things about the MRT case is that the data you want has to do with reproductive age of the offspring, and so that makes it all the more challenging and difficult. But if we can't collect it, then we really have no way to to go forward. So th this is sort of uncharted territory, and whether the FDA could, as part of its approval, include that. Right. They seem to think not, but there's going to be some conversation if they're ever permitted to accept an IND application. Um, th there will be some conversation about how, how far they can go as a condition of approval, in the, certainly in the clinical trial phase, and maybe even in the approval of the technology phase. So that's sort of unusual. The other thing to say is that there's a kind of, this is now my philosopher's hat, a kind of a metaphysical puzzle here in that how do you describe what MRT is? Are you curing the, a disease or preventing it in an individual person? In other words, would it be you with or without the disease? Or by MRT, are we actually creating a different person than would otherwise have existed? Because if it's number one, it's a kind of easier risk-benefit right, construct. If it's number two, then how do we trade off right, the benefit of being a new person versus the, the fact that the person who would have existed doesn't get to exist? We, we don't have any way to, to answer that question as a matter of policy, certainly. And so even answering that question is impossible. How would we know? You can't do a trial where you would able you know control such that we would learn the answer to that question. So really challenging when it comes to, to policy. And you know, the FDA is kind of flummoxed in a whole bunch of ways, not least of which is they've never gotten to regulate reproductive technologies. So they don't, they don't begin to know how to deal with this. So it's, it's not a very help, hopeful answer, unfortunately. And there's more we could talk, but let's talk after. Um, there, is there a question? Yeah, England is um, national health care. We aren't. 
So how does that affect their decision and their ability to evaluate and counsel yeah. and also get a real consent from the parents for the procedure? Sorry, what I don't the second part I'm not The consent, well, in this country your insurance would be affected certainly by <clears throat> the this decision because this will go on their record forever, right? That they have this. Oh, sure, it would be something that would be subject to their yeah health care provider knowing and their insurance. That will affect their policies. <clears throat> but well, in England, it doesn't because it's a national health care. Right. Um, well, so it's probably not going to be the answer you expected. But the the UK, <clears throat> pardon me, context is helpful in in allowing them to do controversial things in a very tightly controlled way, because of the fact that they have national the national health service. And so they also have something that regulates the creation and use of human embryos by whatever technology, um, which is called, believe it or not, the Human Fertilization and Embryology Authority, the HFEA. It sounds a little Orwellian, but, but it, it exists and it actually is a helpful means of being able to do things that seem very leading edge and controversial in a controlled way. So they actually have made a, a decision to license MRT to one clinic and one patient at a time, go forward, assess the results before they issue another license. So it's a one-off. In the US, we have an FDA that goes through a very laborious and tightly controlled process, but once it's through the approval, it's then open and available. We have a, a bottleneck at that one point. So we don't have the kind of longitudinal oversight and control that the UK can assert because of their National Health Service. We have a one-time approval through the FDA, which may take a long time, but once you're through that, you then have this problem of um, off-label use, right? How do you con control for expanded use in ways that were not envisioned? So the, the UK is in a better position, actually, to deal with this. In terms of the sort of the, whether this shows up in, in, you know, in your record, you know, I think people would want this to be covered. It's going to be extraordinarily expensive. And so they will, I, I presume, appeal for coverage rather than try to hide the fact that they're doing it. That would be my, my guess, but, but maybe that's wrong. I guess we'll see. Um, there's, uh, there are two questions that are, uh, have been come up on the prompter, and, and I'll just combine them, Jeff. And um, one really concerns how long is long enough for uh, follow-up, and yeah. when do we declare sort of success or failure. And the second is, is sort of related to that, which is uh, what do the guidelines say relative to judging outcome? Yeah, uh, it's really hard to know the answer to those questions. And part of it will be a learn-as-you-go model, um, which is increasingly something that the scientific community is more comfortable with. So I think it will be very hard at the outset to say, and, and we'll know after X number, um, whether this is sufficient, it's especially in a new technology like M MRT and maybe some of the gene editing applications. I will say, you know, gene editing in somatic applications is, is just gene transfer with better tools, gene therapy with better tools. And so there's a long-standing process through which um, companies and a academic researchers must go for approval to do those in, in humans. So it's really only using new technologies to follow that same pathway. It's the modification of embryos that is much more challenging to figure out how we measure results and, and better or worse outcomes. So uh, I, I think there will be lots of conversation about this and there will be a lot of information shared as the countries that go first share their information with us. I, I fully believe that there will be the UK experience with MRT well before we go forward. There probably will be Chinese experience with human editing uh, of em embryos that are um, edited and we'll learn from that experience well before we get to go forward. So there will be information that we can um, build upon. Jeff, I have a question that kind of turns everything a little bit on its head. You know, you've been in the field for a good while, and, and we've seen that there were a lot of fears relative to how fetal tissue would be used. There were fears about how uh, this uh, in vitro fertilization would be used. Uh, and we now see fears relative to uh, how gene editing might be used. So many of what we formerly considered fears have now proved true. We've moved the field. Where are the red lines? Where, where, yeah. where do you see uh, 
that someone will say, this is not, we cannot go any further. This is something that would be clearly an ethical violation. Uh, I think that the, that line has, has moved, which is your point. I, th I think, and I think it's right. Um, so there, there's a few aspects of that. So up, up till this human gene editing report, and I should have said Matthew um, Porteous, one of your colleagues in pediatrics, was a member of that committee um, with me and, and was a, an active um, participant in the discussions about this question. Uh, so there had been a bright line prohibition on modifications that would be heritable. No germline modifications. And that has been, it still is, the policy of the NIH, by the way. So there, it may be kind of a moot point here. But, but the argument on, in the pushback was, well, what are the reasons for that? And, and the only thing people could point to was, it's, it's too uncertain. The, the results of things that modify the germline are too uncertain. Uh, so it's a safety question. And we, we can't control it in ways that we can be confident that when we introduce it, it won't lead to really unexpected, untoward results. And so the, f the folks who are doing work with gene editing say we're in a much better place in predicting some of those things now and, and have confidence that we can get the benefits with much lower levels of risk. So if that's true, we, the argument wasn't made about the sort of foundational ethical impermissibility of germline modification, at least wasn't made well enough. And so if that is the red line we want to maintain, there needs to be a better argument about why it's not ethically permissible. And so you, then you get into things like shorthand. It's, it's wrong because it's, it's playing God in ways we ought not. And that's shorthand for lots of different kinds of arguments. And if that's a good enough argument for saying when we should and shouldn't go forward, we would need to flesh that out. There's an argument that's actually much more um, tractable in Europe than it is in the US about the inviolability of the human genome. That is some kind of a, a, a inheritance of humankind that we shouldn't alter. Doesn't resonate much with me, but there's something called the Oviedo Convention that the Council of Europe has, has many signatory countries in Europe about which effectively endorse that and would therefore mean there is no permissible way to introduce a genetic change that would be passed on to future generations. So it's a way of making an argument against germline modification. Now, the, on the flip side, you know, we've said for, there, there have been lots of examples, and I think you're alluding to this, where the introduction of new controversial technologies first met with kind of revulsion, kind of a yuck factor. And then we gradually get more used to it to the, and to the point where we clamor for more access because the supply is too limited for the demand that gets created. And the question is, are we on a trajectory like that? And if so, you know, when, when have we crossed a line in a way that you're suggesting we ought not? That's the work that really needs to be done. And I, I, you know, I wake up every day and get to talk about these kinds of things, so I, I'm lucky that there's the scientific advances that press on these questions in ways that I hope we can be helpful. I don't know if you all saw the story this morning about the, the baby that was born four years after, I don't know, it was his or her parents had died. So a frozen embryo was implanted into a surrogate four years after their parents were killed in an accident. And my wife said, do you, do you know this case? I said, no, but that could never happen in the US. Where was it? It was, so it was a, an Asian country where the, the parents of one of the deceased biological parents wanted to have grandchildren and so made a plea for the frozen embryos to be implanted into a surrogate so they could have their grandchild. Wow. So there you go. It's not exactly the kind of thing you're asking, but, but you know, that's what technology permits us to, to think about and potentially do in ways that we couldn't before. Great. Thank you. Do we have a question in the front? Oh, there's one down on the uh, monitor. There is uh, one on the monitor. Jeff, if, if we were to offer this treatment to families, what type of screening and counseling and education would be required and uh, how much regulatory oversight would be required? That's a great question. So l l assuming that that's about mitochondria replacement. So among the, the recommendations that were made to the FDA, and I should say, so that, that report has very um, detailed recommendations about how this, what steps and in what order and how they should be done. And the FDA w was ready to adopt and enact them all until this change in the budget bill happened, and then they were caught sort of stopped dead in the water. So among the, the 
um, conditions and really restrictions that answer this question was that it needs to be a disease that you, you know will be passed on. So there's varying levels of certainty of mitochondrial DNA disease passage from mother to offspring. So there, there are some that are nearly 100%. So that, that would be one condition. Second, it needs to be a sufficiently bad disease that it's worthy of, of this level of intervention. Uh, and then there needs to be this follow-up that we were talking about before from the question on that side of the room. And so, you know, those are pretty heavy conditions. And if people are willing to accept those and then go through the process of informed consent, we've never done this before. We don't know what will happen. You know, there's a lot of risk here. Are you willing to accept that risk on behalf of your future offspring and go through all of those stepwise? Now, I will say, the, all women who came to testify about this said, I would do this, you know, tomorrow if you let me, because I have X number of children, all of whom have this terrible disease. I don't want to do this again. And, and interesting, they said, and if you will not let me do this, I'll just keep trying to have more children. So it was sort of, well, I'm going to hold you hostage, society, and start keep having children who have this terrible disease until you let me pursue what I want. Seems an interesting way about it. Jeff, uh, one question on the monitor, and then I'm going to ask you the final one. What, what worries you most about uh, health care right now? That not enough people have access to what they need. I mean, that's, that's the easy answer. Um, the difficult answer is what to do about it, of course. And, you know, the storm and drang going on in Washington is really, really sad to watch. I... Um, I spend my days working in a place that's about as different from where we're sitting in Palo Alto than any place could be, where the community in East Baltimore doesn't have access to basic health care. Um, and we sit at Johns Hopkins providing, you know, some of the world's best. And that's, that's, that's a horrible thing to walk into every day. And we at Hopkins, and I know you, you two here at Stanford, treat everybody who needs to be treated, but it's not the right way about the answer to that question. So, you know, that, the, the obvious answer to that question is we, we need to do better by the citizens of this country, uh, whereby we spend the largest proportion of GDP by percentage in the world on health care, but people don't have access. Uh, thank you for that, that answer. Uh, I'd just like to close with uh, just one, one question that really um, you can probably answer best uh, of anyone. T tell me a little bit about uh, your thoughts regarding what we can do relative to uh, large animal work, especially relative to primate biology. It's kind of relevant to, yeah. to this particular topic, and, and you can share with the audience your uh, expertise or insight into this area. Yeah, so, so David mentioned the Jane Goodall reference. So I, I chaired uh, what was in the, Nash, the uh, Institute of Medicine, now the National Academy of Medicine. There was a committee that the NIH asked to be convened to determine uh, when um, chimpanzees needed to be used in biomedical research. And the criteria that got um, articulated were then adopted as, as policy of the NIH, and they decided, you may remember, at the end of 2015 to no longer fund any more work um, using chimpanzees. Controversial in a whole bunch of ways. We, we can talk about it if you want after, after we're done. But um, an interesting sort of pressing on the question of, of what the appropriate non-human animal models are for human disease. Um, and there's a, a, a sort of crisis, as you know, in, in translation from, hu from, from non-human animal research into human health. And so I think one of the, the good things that's happened is sort of forcing that discussion. So chimpanzees were largely used for uh, models of, of human health where the humans either couldn't be or was just more efficient to use chimpanzees. So one answer is use humans. And you can use humans in all sorts of ways in a much more nuanced way than used to be the case. Um, the, the current debate is really around other non-human primates and what's the appropriate use uh, and, and for what. And I, I think that there's healthy discussion about sort of justifying criteria. When is it appropriate? For what? What can we learn from them? And how to do it in a way that's, you know, that's um, most acceptable for the welfare of those animals, but also to learn what we think we're learning from the huge investment that it takes to use those animals for research. 
So I think it's a very healthy thing that we're having that conversation in a way that will only lead to larger public support for that use of, of non-human animals for human purposes. I don't think we're headed towards a time when we won't use animals anymore at all, although maybe in a you know, distant future there'll be all sorts of replacements. But uh, a healthy discussion about what's appropriate and when, I think, is, is long overdue, and that's what we're doing now. Great. Well, thank you all, uh, and thank you, Dr. Khan, for sure. such an erudite and expansive discussion. We really appreciate it. And uh, Dr. Khan will be available throughout the conference to have conversations and to speak with you informally. Uh, I think we're now uh, ready for a break. Thank you very much.